I think in a disrupted world, politicians would need to manage effectively different stakeholders um, and engage them in different ways. We more and more now need governments that act fast and government that tend to probably run a country like they run a business. Because on the one hand side, we hear about all these technologies and how politicians are more and more able to deeply understand their voters, but apparently at the same time, it seems they don't. Education has to train us to be resilient and flexible and be able to handle uncertain situations. There is really no nothing that prepares us for the dynamic situation that is happening in the world. Your technical skills today might be irrelevant in even five years. So five years is a, is a super short time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on, you've all had your breakfast, you're wide awake, raring to go here at the St. Gallen Symposium, I hope. We have a great panel discussion in store for you this morning to kick things off. Uh, my name is Mehdi Hassan. I'm a broadcaster and columnist from the UK, now based in the US of A, so to follow Lord Griffith's point, I get two points for disruption. Um, great to be back in Europe as a chocolate lover, great to be in Switzerland, of course, at the invitation of the St. Gallen Symposium, which is an astonishing 47 years old, uh, 10 years older than I am, about to celebrate its 50th birthday, congratulations. The world today, however, is very different as you would all agree, to the world of 1970. In fact, the world of 2017 is very different to the world of 2015. Uh, you only have to look at what's come in between. If you need any proof that we live in an age of disruption, just look at last year, look at 2016. Brexit, Trump, the Eurozone crisis, the migrant crises, the rise and rise of China, the ongoing battle against ISIS. Today, we have growing insecurity and anxiety across vast swathes of the world, not just the Western world, but across the world, about income, jobs, <laughs> traditional ways of life. Political and cultural disruption have been matched, if not exceeded, by technological disruption, not just in terms of IT and the internet, but in the rise of automation and AI. Today, more and more pe people feel anxiety about their futures. We've heard about the importance of securing jobs, apprenticeships, governments across the world now face a challenge of not just creating jobs, but meaningful jobs. Not just maintaining jobs, but worthwhile jobs. Governments have had to adapt their education systems just to keep up with the dramatic and rapid pace of change. And education itself, which was once only for the young, is now for everyone. It has to be. Meanwhile, young people across the world feel left out, left behind. To put it bluntly, they feel screwed over by their parents and grandparents' generations who had the kind of security and stability that they desperately crave in this disrupted world of ours. So what do we do about all this? What can we do to cope with these interconnected and very global challenges and crises? What can some of the smaller, yet nevertheless successful and dynamic members of the global economy teach the rest of us about potential ways forward? Where is the innovation and outside the box thinking coming from, if anywhere? We have a great panel for you today to discuss all these topics and more. We have an economy minister, a foreign minister, and education ministers. We're covering all the relevant issues. We're very lucky and honored to have them here. Uh, Ong Yee Kung is Minister for Education and Second Minister for Defense of the Republic of Singapore. Prior to his cabinet appointment, prior to being elected to parliament in 2015 for the Governing People's Actions Party, he was in strategic planning. And Samuelson is Denmark's Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's had that role since December. Uh, he sits in Parliament for the Liberal Alliance. He served as a member of the European Parliament too. Uh, and he worked in the consulting industry prior to entering politics. Uh, Johan Schneider, Aman needs no introduction. We've heard two uh, brilliant speeches from him already. Uh, federal Council of the Swiss Confederation in charge of the Federal Department of Economic Affairs, Education, Research. Last year, President of the Swiss Confederation. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. So I'm going to kick off with a question to all of our panelists and to all of you. Let's engage the audience here. If you have the uh, Symposium app on your phone, and if you don't, you can download it now, um, there's a question that the Symposium is asking everyone who's attending to vote on across the course of this morning today. Which political skill set is needed the most in times of disruption? Decisiveness, responsiveness, or adaptability? And I want to kick off our discussion by asking that question to Anders Samuelsson. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. Well, I think uh, the most important skill for a politician right now is to be able to listen. In fact, that is the most important. That is what I've learned through my years in politics. I decided to try to disrupt Danish politics 10 years ago when I decided to start my own political par party. Uh, that was a disaster. <laughs> It was really a disaster for two and three, three, uh, three years, but that is how I think it is in, in private enterprises also. You have to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail and listen, and then perhaps you can become a success. Now I've entered the Danish government, uh, my party has entered the, the Danish government, and what we have tried to do is to, to uh, what we found out was that we, we had to listen to people that were more clever than us, because politicians don't know anything. Everybody of you, you know Lego, I guess, the Danish famous brand for children. It, it wasn't invented by a politician, I can assure you that. <laughs> it was an, uh, invented by an entrepreneur, and, uh, and what we can do as a politician is to try to, to create the right frames so we as a nation, Denmark, the people of Denmark, can be part of the winning team uh, in the next generation. And one thing I think that is very important for us is to listen to our own family and friends. Because if we just listen to uh, or, or try to convince ourselves that uh, globalization is only good, and I think it is good, it has brought a lot of people out of poverty. The famous uh, uh, Swedish professor Hans Rosling once said that the problem for poor people in the world is not globalization, it's not being part of globalization. That is a big problem because that is what will keep them in poverty. Now, if you, if you look around in your own family, I'm sure that you know young people, that perhaps one of your sons or daughters, that are going to have a great time in this new world. And they're going to be successful, and they will have the whole world as their, their, their playing field. But you also know perhaps a son or a daughter or a cousin or a friend's daughter that, is, that are going to have troubles. That, that, is, that, that are unsecure of what is going on tomorrow. And if we can listen to their, their problems or their fear and try to build a bridge between their fears and tomorrow, that is what <coughs> will give us hope. And that is what we have tried in my party. So we only have 7.5% votes in, in, in the general election in Denmark, but among those who are between 18 and 25, we have 25% votes of backing. And that gives me kind of a hope. So being able to listen, that is the most important thing for a politician, I think. Thank you. Okay. Ongi Kang, which of those three qualities would you pick? The audience is heading for adaptability, I see. Uh, this crowd wisdom, is, uh, according to crowd wisdom, is adaptability. Yeah. Uh, you know, such questions, ultimately, you know, all three are important. Mm. You know, uh, I, I just realized after you point out that why the three of us is on stage, because we all come from small countries. And of all three sm small countries, Singapore is the smallest. And so whether we have to be decisive, adaptable, responsive, uh, has always been our DNA. But I would, uh, so I would say all three are extremely important. But if I were to just add one more, politicians today must have a sense of humor. <laughs> Because whatever you try, there'll be times when you will fail. Yeah. Whatever you try, there'll be times when people laugh at you. And sometimes it helps to laugh at yourself. Yeah. Because there's an important ingredient to be resilient and just keep on trying as things are changing so fast. Okay. Uh, Johan, small countries, three small countries. How do small countries, but successful countries like your own, how do they stand out? How do you punch above your weight in an age of disruption? First of all, I share that politicians need to stay uh, not only optimistic, but also uh, humoristic. Uh, secondly, so smaller states are better transparent and hence uh, better organizable. And uh, uh, coming to your question, uh, we, we do have to focus on a few principles, make sure that we lift them uh, thoroughly, 
and defend our interests in the global uh, community against the bigger markets and principles in my country uh, I mentioned them before uh, are at least for me in my capacities make sure that each and everybody gets a chance make sure that we keep our labor laws as liberal as possible and the third one is prevent the country from laws and laws and laws and bureaucracy hence make sure that we lift the social partnership which is a contractual basis and keeps us flexible and in terms of education it's one of the big subjects uh, for this symposium um, how much and feel free for any of you to jump in here how much do you think the education systems as we've known them and understood them for years decades now how much do they need to change how much do we need to disrupt the way we teach kids in order to keep up with the general disruption at political and especially technological levels oh, since I'm education minister um, I think it depends on the cultural context that you're asking this question from where I come from in Asia there is always a very strong emphasis on education. So I think that is a strong point uh, and strong foundation that we have. Uh, on the other hand, in Asia, the emphasis on education tend to be academic. Most parents, or in Singapore at least, most parents want their children to grow up to be doctors or lawyers, um, and sometimes civil servants. Um, but given the changes that's happening today, that actually we need to shift quite a little bit. Because look at the, I, we always admire the Swiss system of, um, and that's all, uh, Den Denmark system as well, and German system of a uh, dual education track. It actually opens up a lot of possibilities for young people, so that you are not single-mindedly chasing just after academic qualifications, but you can be a craftsman in a wide range of fields. And that, as a concept, is not totally familiar to Asia yet. But Singapore being decisive, responsible, and trying to be adaptive all the time, <laughs> we have to adopt what is best in the world to improve our system. And today, we have a strong emphasis on skills, on learning skills. And there's a logic to that. Because today, information and knowledge is all on the internet. And you can Google and find out everything in the world. But skills you get from experience, from doing, and you can't Google for skills. And that, I think, has a premium. And our education system has to be lifelong and emphasize on the acquisition of skills. You have the Skills Future program yes, in Singapore. Yes, I, I try to not to mention... Uh, I'll mention it for yeah. you. <laughs> Modest Minister, you have the Skills Future program uh, in your country. Do you think that's now a model? Can the adult, the, the kind of whole life experience of acquiring skills ready for your next job, your next career change? Is that a model for other countries? No, it's a model that we think will work for Singapore, given our cultural context of very strong emphasis on education already, but academic education, but we want to learn from Switzerland, from Denmark, from Germany, and combine it with okay. acquisition of skills. So let me turn that on its head. Yeah. Anders Samuelson, we hear so much in Europe about the Asian model, the Asian emphasis on education. Has Europe been left behind, number one? And number two, in an age of disruption, can it afford to be left behind on this subject of acquiring skills, especially across the whole of life? Well, I think perhaps one of the things that we have forgotten in the Western part of, yeah, in, in Europe especially, perhaps, is uh, <coughs> The sharing of information, that was what made us great. That was what made us rich. I can give a story from uh, back home from Denmark. 150 years ago, when, uh, when we were a very poor country, uh, a lot of farmers uh, built up an organization where they shared information. And in, in quite, quite a short uh, while, they were able to uh, redefine what it was to be a farmer and be very competitive and being able to export a lot of uh, goods uh, to, to, to England. And 150 years later, just 10 years ago, we had the same situation, in fact, in a, in a very much more globalized world in the fur industry, uh, mink industry uh, in Denmark. A lot of mink farmers, they joined together in an organization where they 
were the, the one demand to be a member of that organization was that they should share all their information with their competitors in Denmark. And in just five years, they managed to become one of the biggest exporters of fur uh, to China, to Asia, and, and so on, in, in growing emerging markets. How, how did they do that? Because they, instead of keeping the information for themselves, because they hoped to, be, to uh, outcompete the others, they learned from each other and made a very steep learning cur curve. So I think that is also a part of education, being able to learn from each other and again, listen to, to each other. So you have to, to, to make this ability, because you, you have to learn certain basic things in an education system, but what is very important for the next generation is to be open-minded, to, 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 to be able to believe in freedom and sharing of information. And that is, of course, and, I, and that's just to, 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 to finish off the, the idea of this, uh, this situation with small countries. That is perhaps one of the advantages that small countries have, that you can adapt very quickly to new situations because you kind of trust each other in another way that perhaps you are able to do in big, big, big uh, countries where it's very, very difficult to make even small changes. So a very good point about sharing information across countries within and between. Uh, and on that note, uh, Johan, you mentioned in your speech a moment ago that you had the opportunity to speak with President Trump. Uh, which one must have been one of the most highbrow and intellectually satisfying conversations of your life, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. But the, uh, on the subject of leaders like Trump, what do you do in a disrupted world when you're confronted with rapid change, uh, great uncertainty and anxiety across nations, and then you have leaders like Trump and others who want to hunker down, they want to isolate themselves, they want to cut themselves off in many ways uh, from the rest of the world. They see their neighbors even uh, through the prism of a zero-sum game. What do you say to them? I do not come back to the uh, phone call with uh, Donald Trump, but I want to mention another personality which uh, uh, knows my fullest, fullest uh, respect. That's the president of the World Bank. The president of the World Bank closed uh, the uh, autumn uh, gathering a few months ago in summarizing and saying, my dear ministers around this table, 70 uh, ministers, if you want to know why Germany and Switzerland uh, are such uh, attractive countries as far as unemployment is concerned, please go and uh, study and make sure that you understand. We uh, Swiss, we were extremely proud about uh, Kim's uh, remark. And I uh, mentioned to him when we left, uh, my dear uh, friend, Dr. Kim, you uh, came up with a great uh, compliment to my country, but you made, one, you made a mistake. You mentioned first Germany and secondly Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> and, now to, and now to your question. <laughs> you, you bought yourself enough time. One thing is, in my understanding and in my persuasion, absolutely crucial and it has nothing to do with disruption. Namely, make sure that your people get a first quality education. And our system is an integral system, a flexible system, a system with passerelles. Uh, you can uh, enter into the system uh, Come, a, come ahead and realize that you are probably not uh, where you wanted to, to, to go, and then you get a chance to change and you have, uh, at maximum, lost a little bit of time, but not uh, an uh, a experience uh, to become uh, educated. In other words, disruption for me is a crucial issue. I have fullest respect about the uh, consequences which we will face in uh, the upcoming uh, future. But one of the medicines against the risks of uh, the disruption uh, revolution, uh, revolution 
must be the, the education, the basic education, and this education being done uh, stupef stupefied uh, uh, with all consequences, without compromises, it helps anyway. And uh, digitalization, last remark. We were almost, we had almost finished our message to the Swiss Parliament as far as uh, education, innovation is concerned uh, two years ago for the period 1720. And I was uh, wondering on whether we touched the issue digitalization or not. I'm honest, in 2015, the Swiss specialists about education <coughs> did not really focus on the digitalization and the consequences of the digitalization in the upcoming years. In the very last minute, we complemented our message. It's now a message for the same period of time, but principally uh, focusing on digitalization consequences and how to, how to deal with. We, uh, we got awake and we uh, got a curve uh, and it's coming up so quickly uh, that, we, that, we, that we were almost uh, overrun. And coming back to my first uh, remark, whatever happens, the basic schooling uh, education uh, okay. uh, offer must be kept. Can I jump yes, in on please. this? Yeah. I think we sometimes are at the risk of conflating disruption with unexpected political outcomes. Uh, both are happening at the same time. They may be related, but not to over-conflate it. No? Uh, first is actually disruption is not new. It's not only this decade that we are seeing it. Clayton Christensen has been writing about it since the Industrial Revolution, steam engine, petrochemicals, automobiles, handphones, digitization. Disruption has always happened. And each time it happened, it destroys jobs, it creates jobs. But humans, we can adapt to it and we retrain ourselves. Similarly, uh, unexpected political outcomes is also not new. Uh, since 1945, Winston Churchill won the Second World War and lost the election, right? Uh, 2009, DPJ ended 50 years of LDP rule. That's also a surprise. Uh, 1960, JFK could beat uh, Richard Nixon. There was the advent of TV, TV campaign, and he looked so much different compared to Nixon. So we have also seen unexpected political outcomes. So what we see now is also not entirely new. But I think what we need to be cognizant of is that every time there's an unexpected political outcome, they are due to factors and driving forces that has been brewing for a long time, and then it all burst out, leading to a change in political system. And I think what we are seeing now, whether it's Brexit, whether it's the US election, perhaps have something to do with the global financial crisis. That post-crisis, large majority of workers saw stagnant or falling real wages, and life is not improving. And at the same time, there's a certain undermining and erosion of the social compact between the elites and the masses, 99% versus 1%. Occupy Wall Street, that's no more, but I think the sentiments continue to linger on. So I absolutely agree with the Federal Council. We have to make sure to solve this, there has to rebuild trust uh, and social compact between elites and the masses, and ensuring that you have jobs and continue to have wage increases, continue to have improving lives. What would you say to critics of your country that say, well, you can't really do that if you're effectively a one-party state? A lot of people say, look, Singapore, it's not as democratic as it could be. What do you say to them? Well, I just mentioned the taste of the pudding is in the eating, right? <laughs> so <laughs> look at Singapore since world financial crisis, global financial crisis. We were badly affected, but we rebounded we created jobs. During that 10 years or nine years, medium income, bottom quintile income continued to increase. Gini coefficient dropped 
0.44 to 0.40. We see many more social programs, including SkillsFuture, now I'll say it, <laughs> that bring benefits to the masses. And if by doing so, the people decide in open and fair elections, they continue to elect the incumbent, I think we want it fair and square. But one day, if we fail, then some other better party take over and bring benefits to the people. Okay, I want to go to the audience because I know we're running behind. But Von, last question to Anders Sammers, very briefly. You mentioned, interestingly, earlier about how uh, amongst young people you have a 25% vote share as opposed to the population at large. One of the big questions that's going to be coming out of pretty much every panel and discussion <coughs> at this symposium is how do we keep young people on board? How do we engage young people? How do we make sure they're stakeholders in what's going on? Is there any particular uh, policy, proposal, approach that you think works? I think what we, we have to remember also to tell the good stories about globalization. We have to remember to tell the fact that we have seen in 25 years that we have a, had a drop of people living in poverty, uh, dropping from about 40% of the world population to now under 10% of the population. That, that is because of globalization, free market, and being able to learn from each other. So we have to. And I think that is very important to not only talk to the fear in people, but also uh, talking to people, uh, to the hope in people. And if we are able to do that and, and connect to, to, to the next generation, next generation, they, they don't want to live, in a, in a, live a life in fear. They want to live a life in hope. And we will have to remember to, to, take all the, uh, to talk about all the good stories of new technologies. New technologies being able to solve environmental problems. New technologies uh, being able to, to give people education at a, a much lower cost and better education and so on. And then as a country, we also have to face, of course, uh, this new situation. What we have done, I'll just briefly mention that, in Denmark, in the foreign ministry, we also try to disrupt uh, uh, the diplomacy area Usually, we, we in, in the foreign ministry, we connect to other countries. But we have realized in Denmark that we also have to yeah, realize that Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on, big companies, very, very big companies, they are, in fact, bigger than the countries that we, uh, that we work with uh, in, in, on a daily basis. Therefore, we have decided to, announce, to, 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 to have a tech ambassador, an ambassador that reach out to these companies that, in fact, affect daily lives of Danish citizens, not only because of the questions of data protections and so on, but of new opportunities, but also when we are fighting ISIL and so on. We have to work together with Facebook so they are able to close down their accounts, or Twitter to able to uh, close down their accounts so they are not that uh, attractive to uh, foreign fighters and so on. So in a lot of areas, we don't have to... What we do need is not to let fear uh, 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 kick us down. We have to uh, believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today. And if we are able to do that as politicians, as businessmen, and so on, and able to, to reach out to the next generation and give them hope for a new job, as you also uh, always mentioned, then we can connect to the next generation. I'm, I'm certain that we are able to do that. Okay. Um, we're going to open up to the audience. We have less than 20 minutes. We will try and get through as many of your questions, comments as possible. Um, there are mics, I believe, roving in the hall. Um, if you can see, some, if you, ra you want to start raising your hands. Questions, comments, criticisms, no speeches, please. <coughs> Gentleman in the pink shirt with the beard. Is there a microphone? Do we have a mic? No? Anyone have a microphone they want to show? Oh, he's got one. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Herman Arnold. Thank you very much for this interesting discussion. I was a little bit astonished because we're talking about disruption in politics. And for us, it's always easy to talk about other areas where there is disruption. My question is, what is your solution to disrupting politics, the, the business you are in? Because when you look in history, most of the time when political systems got disrupted, it was connected with war and with very bad events till there was a disruption in the system. And I see our political systems at the end of the possibilities of producing solutions. We see it everywhere. That means we have to disrupt politics. And my question is what you are doing to disrupt your own business. And I totally understand it's very difficult. Normally, nobody can disrupt itself. We see it throughout the history. But is there hope? 
Okay, I'm going I'm to put that question to Anders. You're a for EU foreign minister. Um, Britain's done a fair deal to disrupt uh, the EU's political system. Um, how much disruption is going on in the EU, and how do you, how do you be part of that in a positive way? Well, we have, uh, for, for the last two years, uh, had a lot of these stories of, of, of all of us fearing that uh, populism will out-compete uh, uh, the more... Uh, well, easy answers will out-compete difficult answers mm. to difficult questions. Um, I have to, to, to yeah, it, it, disrupting politics. What I saw in Danish politics was a situation 10 years ago where the progressive voters, those who had hope for tomorrows and so on, they had, they had already decided whether they would vote to the left or to the right in the parliament. And nothing could convince them to cross the bridge. So they were, in fact, locked in their position. Those voters who decided the outcome of any election in Denmark for the last 20 years, that was the, the, the voters that were afraid of the future because they went for easy answers. And, uh, and the old parties, they realized that. So they didn't take care or didn't uh, communicate with the, with the progressive voters or the hopeful voters, even though they perhaps were a majority. No, they started to talk directly to those who uh, were, um, ab they, they were able to connect to if they talked to their fear. So they could change from one side to another. And that was, in fact, why we decided to start my, uh, my new party, the Liberal Alliance, because we wanted to talk directly to those voters who believed in tomorrow, not in a, uh, a naive way, but that uh, believed in, in tomorrow. And if we could connect to them and, and could maybe enable them to swift sides, in fact, they could become a power of tomorrow. So what, what I guess is the big problem in politics right now is that the old system, in a way, puts power to the most uh, populist uh, in, in, with the new media and so on. And that is what we've seen in the election campaign in US, in Netherlands, perhaps partly in France, uh, is that we give the floor to those who have the easy answers. And it's so difficult to be a player with more difficult answers. But if you insist, and if you insist, and if you keep on going, and if you do like, I, say, I guess it was James Carwell, the, uh, the advisor to uh, Bill Clinton, who he, he once wrote a book saying, uh, suck up, bug up, and come back when you foul up, saying that you have to really work hard on this. If you do that, and if you do insist, then you're able to perhaps swift the agenda and make the decisive votes, not those who are afraid of the future, but those who hope in the, in, in the future, and perhaps the story of Macron is uh, the story of that, perhaps. Okay. Do either of you want to come in or we'll go back to the audience? Okay, we'll go back to the audience. We'll take some more questions, comment. Yes, gentlemen waving at the back of the room. Uh, thank you very much. So my, my name is Louis Klein. I come from Berlin. I'm here with the Agora 42. It's a philosophical business magazine. I have a question about an irritation that came with the leaders of, of tomorrow yesterday and uh, we saw it earlier in the video, the notion that a state can be run like a business. And uh, the first uh, question from the auditorium uh, was pointing in that direction. But isn't the nature of a business organization the nature of exclusibility so that you can choose who is a member, a part, an employee of your company and that you can leave people behind and out because you have the right to rule inclusion and exclusion in a business company. And how does that change the entire idea of looking at politics in a situation where you cannot do that? You can't lay off citizens if you don't like them, if they don't perform to the level that you like. And out of the list that we saw earlier, wouldn't care be the decisive and center skill of politicians and to enable care for those who through all the education and all the, the efforts do not make it to be part and participate on the economic growth and the globalization. Thank okay. you very much. Good question. Johan? The answer is uh, no, no chance. You can't uh, manage a country, a government, uh, as you, as you uh, 
uh, lead a, a, a business. I came uh, from, from the business side. I was used to, to take decisions. I was used to go through processes and then, and then uh, uh, to conclusions. Uh, I had to learn the hard way that uh, not only six of my colleagues uh, participate in the decision making, but also 246 in the parliament, uh, thousands uh, out in the uh, journalist's uh, environment, <laughs> <laughs> and hence uh, there is no chance. What, uh, what, uh, what uh, we can aim at, and we try hard to do so in uh, Bern, is to to go through a certain standard of process in preparing projects, in making sure that we understand what we are speaking about, uh, all the same uh, understanding, and then uh, detail, and after having detailed, uh, take a preliminary decision uh, again, and, uh, and then finalize, and even if you are the minister of uh, economic affairs, you have to decide uh, about health, uh, uh, health uh, 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 dossiers, and you have to understand a little bit this uh, strange uh, topic. And I think we, we found a way how to, to increase efficiency and effectiveness in going through our processes. But it's far away from a discussion in a management team and in a board of directors and uh, taking uh, decisions in the private, uh, in the private environment. Um, Ongi, can I take on board the other part of the gentleman's question, which was a lot of, you know, we talk a lot, great deal about education. You opened it, we're talking about the emphasis on education. But there are a lot of people who go through the education system, who do well, who get all the skills that quote unquote, we expect them to get, and still are quote unquote left behind. What do you do about that? In some parts of the world, growing numbers of people who are well-educated, well-skilled, but cannot find a role in the national or global economy. How do you ensure that they still have a vested interest in what's going on? There, there has to be an alignment between the structure of your economy versus what you educate your people in. I think there are also many Asian examples where there's an overproduction of graduates, uh, like what you mentioned, and you have a big graduate unemployment problem. In Singapore, we kept the ratio as about 30 to 40 percent. Our graduates' unemployment rate is very low, and as for the rest, we train them in vocation, and they go into industry. So this, I suppose, is easier for Singapore being very small, and we can get this planning in place. But I thought there was also an interesting issue about how we disrupt politics. Uh, yesterday, the president of Estonia made an interesting point, which is even as you have Uber and share cabs, and it disrupted the entire industry, it still involves sitting in a car, going from one point to another. So some things don't change. And I think that despite all the technological advancement and disruption, the nation state continues to be the most sensible way of organizing humankind. <coughs> Uh, for many of us, democracy continues to be the correct political system in our circumstances. But so long as you have democracy, it goes back. Politics is about bringing better life to the people, or at least not make life get worse. And that has to do with employment, it has to do with uh, education, a sense of self. Even in a very globalized world, you still feel that we are a society. Nobody can sacked, can be sacked. Nobody, no new people can be just re, uh, replace your existing people. Everyone is a citizen, and you must hold yourself together as a society. So economic well-being, a sense of self, maintaining trust as a social compact, maintaining that social compact, that will be the big challenges in a disruptive world. OK, we'll try and squeeze in a couple more questions. Lady at the back there with her hand up. Hello, good morning. Um, so it's 2017, and we have a panel of four powerful men, uh, if I may say older men, um, discussing... I'm under 40. I'm under 40. Come on, give me that. Give me that. <laughs> discussing what is wrong with the world and its future. I think, of course, 
as an African Arab young woman, that is what's wrong with the future and the world today. And this should not be the future. So I want, of course, it's great to talk about IT and technologies and robotics, but let's go back to the basics. I want to ask you, as four powerful men, and I'm including the host here, um, what do you do in your countries, but also abroad, to ensure that the real world is more inclusive and more diverse so that panels that represent it, like today's panels, become more inclusive and diverse in the future? It's a very good question. I'm glad you raised the issue of diversity. I was going to raise it and I forgot it. All male panels, I think, are a bad thing. There was a, to be fair to the St. Gallen Symposium, there was a female minister supposed to be on this panel who had to pull out this week, just to be fair. But you're right, in general, look across the room, look across the panel. How do you take on board that question? What do you do, Anders Samuelson, to deal with the problem that she identifies so eloquently? Well, what, what I can do is uh, acting uh, in politics according to your values, in fact. So I have six ministers in, uh, uh, my small party has six ministers in our government. Three of them are women. Uh, one of uh, them is an old woman, 65 years old. She has been working with elder people for 40 years. So she is a kind of ex an experiment in politics. Uh, is it able, are we able to, uh, to incorporate uh, uh, people from, from real life into politics? This is kind of an experiment. She has become the elder minister. And I think it's a, it's a core value in a liberal world that you, uh, 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 diversity. Because diversity means um, that we differ from each other. And that is, if we don't differ from each other, we cannot learn anything new. So this is, for me, it's a core value. And I, I, I really try to, to, to work on, uh, on these kind of issues every day. Perhaps also because uh, my elder sister, she's now Minister of Culture in Denmark, it's nice to be a little brother, uh, especially when you call me old man, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to appoint your very clever bigger sister to be, uh, that is now the uh, Minister of Culture in Denmark. And she used to be a, um, a women fighter uh, in Denmark. Uh, and, um, and, and, and to, to announce her to, to, to become a minister and, uh, and, 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 and as part of another generation, the 68 generation in fact, um, reaching out for the next generation of women and being an example in herself, I think uh, that's, that's really, really important of course. But I also think that when I, when I look into my own, own, uh, own, uh, own party, um, every day we reach out for, to, for example, women just to, to, to take this example to, to, to finish it off. But it is quite difficult to engage quite a lot of women in, into politics, perhaps because they're cleverer than that. They know that this is not a way, this is not a, this is not a business to waste your life in. Perhaps, I don't know. But uh, hopefully we'll see more diversity because diversity is okay. the only way to become clever. Johan, you've been in Swiss politics for a while, you've been in Swiss business. What, do, what, do, what are Swiss politicians, what are Swiss corporations doing, if anything, to really tackle this problem about lack of diversity, both in terms of gender, ethnicity, etc.? We have prescriptions telling us that the uh, gremiums, uh, the teams, the management teams, shall be uh, shall be uh, shaped out of a balanced uh, uh, gender, uh, gender uh, uh, situation. We do not want quota people in our, uh, in our uh, bodies. And the women do not want to be, to be seen as a quota uh, representative. That's absolutely clear with us. And I, uh, I came to Brussels a few days ago and met uh, Cecilia Malmström, the Trade Commissioner. We came in, one after another, and she did not say, hello, my dear. She said, you have a gender problem. <laughs> <laughs> because I had simply a dozen uh, male uh, following me into the, uh, into the meeting room. Then we were sitting at table. On the one side, 12 men, and on the other side, 13 women. 
she had a gender problem, she, uh, she as well. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's try and take. Let's try and take briefly. If I think we have time, two very quick. Because I'm going to take two together. The lady here on the right, yes, you, and the gentleman here in the third row. I'm sorry, we're going to have to cap it there. If you can both be very brief, we'll take them together. My name is Katarina Langold. I work in aerospace industry, and I also work a lot with artificial intelligence. And I think for countries, for companies and countries, it's important to balance two things: make people happy and to be efficient. And I think a big challenge and a big dilemma for all of us as artificial intelligence technology grows is going to be the decision whether we want to keep jobs or to stay efficient. So what is your answer and what is your vision of the future of artificial intelligence technology and how does it keep the jobs and okay. keep people happy? And the gentleman there. Uh, we've talked a lot about adaptability, but the political movements over the last three years have been more about bringing back the past ways, trying to be more conservative than liberal or progressive. So in a way, we need to find a way to be adaptable, but yet to reduce the pace of disruption because people don't like it. As politicians, how do we square that circle? Okay, uh, we'll, take them in that. we'll take them in the order they were given. A, you talked earlier about there's always been disruption, mm. technological disruption, back to the motor car, the phone, human beings, get rid of jobs, create jobs. There is an argument that says we're in a slightly different position now. It's, it's, it's more extreme than before. When you're talking about things like AI, it's very hard to then see how you replicate those jobs that are lost. Yes. So what's your answer to the lady's question? Well, it is true. It's a lot more intense, a lot faster, but you can still learn from history. Uh, you can always learn from history, uh, even for young people. Um, I, and I think related to the earlier questions, Politics, therefore, I think is not a disruptor, but actually it can be a stabilizer, even as we have big upheavals that we are experiencing. You look at industrial revolution, technically you can say it's extremely efficient to make every child work and have child labor, but society and politics, through politics, say no. You can say it's extremely efficient if we just burn all the coal we want and pollute all the air and we produce as much as we can, because technology allows us to do that and society says no. You can say, so what if there's wide income disparity, but there is social upheaval? Society through politics say no. Likewise, as we have a, we, we, I don't think we need to extrapolate in a straight line the trajectory of future of AI, future of um, biomedical sciences, and everything will be manufactured. None of us will be reading books. We'll all be reading ones and zeros. No, everyone's listening to MP3. We can say no. Through politics, society can say no, that we want a balance. And that is when I think uh, the wisdom of politics, of democracy, will come in, have a check and balance, so that we can strike happiness with efficiency. Do you think the balance is right right, right now, as it is? We are at the are beginning we... of a new chapter. I think let's read the other chapters as we carry on. And did you want to take the question about people feel you know, Denmark has been a country which has had to deal with populism, uh, rouse over immigration, etc. You know, people feeling left, but people don't like the pace. A lot of people don't like the pace of change. To go back to Lord Griffiths' speech earlier about the people from somewhere and anywhere. Um, what do you do, do? You see your task as someone who's trying to slow down the disruption? No, uh, no, I, I don't think so because I don't think that I can slow slow down uh, technology te techno technology's uh, ev evolvement because well, it's done in a free market, so it will affect us. 40 years ago, in a part of Denmark, uh, they were more or less living on sewing uh, clothes. And then they were disrupted by Ukraine and China and so on and lost all the jobs. And people thought, what are they going to live off? But they found out that there were new jobs, new kind of, uh, they could be logistic, they could, designing they could be designing the clothes and so on. So we have had this story in Denmark where we have feared losing jobs for the last 50 years, but we have always been able to create new jobs and better better paid jobs, in fact. Uh, they, are, they are more rich in that part of Jutland now than they were 40 years ago. But of course, it's a new situation with artificial in intelligence and so on. But I think that the worst thing that you can do as a politician and in the political system is to try to stop things from happening. And, and uh, this, this uh, debate from the US election campaign, uh, whether they should close down borders and have less free market and so on, what kind of people would, will be most hurt by that? Those who voted for Trump, in fact. 
those who fear the future, they are going to be the losers because mm. the only way that they are going to, to have a better life is, of course, by more free trade, by more uh, being inspired by each other, by, by more competition, I'm sure of that. And then, of course, use that part of richness that comes into your country, the, the necessary part that you, ha that you have to use on education, on social security, and so on. You mentioned that I worked in the consumption business uh, before I entered politics. That is not, uh, in fact, uh, totally correct. <laughs> what I did was working with uh, handicapped people, hard of hearing people and deaf people. So I'm, in fact, able to, to speak a little bit in sign language. That's also nice. As a politician, you are able to speak to deaf people and you're able to be being understood. That's, that's not really uh, what, what is normal in politics, where nobody understands what you're, what you're talking about. But, but what I learned at that time was that e even the, the most uh, marginalized people in Denmark, people who couldn't, uh, uh, who had a social handicap, and that is what you have when you are hard of hearing or deaf, of course, if you soar into their opportunities instead of their handicap, they, they, they also were able to fit into the labor market. Mm. You have to be optimistic, I, I'm sure of that, and we okay. made a lot of successes and a lot of connections between those people and the labor market. But we only did that in the years, in years where business were in an upgoing trend, where you had growth. The moment where you lose growth, where you are in depression and so on in the country, the first who are kicked out of the labor market are the marginalized, it's the handicapped people and, and so on, the, and those with, without education. So be aware of that. Okay. Keep, keep pressure, keep the pressure up for growth. And that is where, just like one, one yeah. mention, where I think that yes, you can compare a country to a business. You can, you, you can make rational plans, and you, I guess you have done that in, in fact in Singapore, you, you've done that in, in Switzerland. Those small countries that are successful, even though they are small, they have in fact been able to kind of make rational plans okay. and, um, and, and, and execute on them. The difficulty is, is of course that democracy is so damn difficult because <laughs> you have to have the support of the population. We'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Let's give a big round of applause to our very young panel.